We are delighted that you are joining our midweek service here at Kingdom Fellowship Christian Center. On behalf of Bishop Jim Logan, our senior pastor, and myself, Lady Sabil Logan, and the entire KFCC family, we welcome you. Those of you who are in the sanctuary, as well as those of you who have tuned in to our live stream. We are indeed grateful for your presence with us this evening. If you are joining us on Facebook, we ask that you would go ahead now and like our KFCC page and share the service with your social media friends. Also, start a watch party. By doing this, you help us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. Also, if you're interested in viewing any of our previously recorded services, whether on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening, replays can be seen on the kfcc.charlotte Facebook page, or you may go over to YouTube and search for Bishop Jim Logan's channel. Remember, while you're there, please like and subscribe. Thank you. We appreciate your support. Tonight, we will continue our study in the book of James, part 16. If this is your first time with us, we hope that you will be blessed by the word of God. For those of you who have joined the live stream, you can go ahead now and grab your pen and pad for another night of transforming study in the book of James. We hope and pray that you've had a blessed and prosperous week. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for yet another day, a day that you have made, a day that we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for being so faithful. We thank you for allowing us, oh God, those of us to make it here into the sanctuary, Lord God. We thank you for traveling mercies. We thank you for those who are tuning in to the live stream. We thank you for the technology, oh God. We thank you for those who will be tuning in with us later. We ask that you would continue to give traveling mercies to those who are yet on their way. Father, we are so excited and we are sitting on the edge of our seats, oh God, waiting for another teaching in the book of James. It has been awesome study, oh God, and so we thank you for continuing, oh God, to, to grow us, oh God, in you. We thank you, Lord, for your word, oh God, your word that changes, your word that refines us, oh God, your word that transforms us, oh God, your word that delivers us, oh God, your word that heals us, oh God. We are so thankful. Father, we ask that you would now touch your manservant, oh God. Speak through him tonight, Lord God, with power and might. Lord, bring back to his remembrance everything, oh God, that you have put in him, oh God. Father, we thank you for blessing your people, oh God, with your word. We ask, oh God, that you would have your way. And Father, we will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For it all belongs to you. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Please receive Bishop Jim Logan at this time. Well, good evening to everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Wednesday night Bible study. We are continuing our study in the book of James. If you were watching this by delayed telecast, uh, you, it may say part 15, but this is actually part 16, and we apologize for that mislabeling. As I begin tonight, let me just simply issue a blanket thank you for all of the birthday wishes that I received on social media for all of social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I am so thankful. There were really far too many for me to respond to individually. So I did my best to respond to as many of them as I could. Please know that 
I don't take it lightly. Whatever you did, whatever you said, whatever you gave, I appreciate it. I don't do it for that. But just like anything else in life, it's always good to hear people appreciate you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, enough of that mushy stuff. Let's, let's, let's go to the word of God. Amen. Y'all know I love you, love you dearly. And my love is not based upon what you do or don't do. I love you anyhow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 So God, we thank you for those individuals who wished me happy birthday, who did certain things. Lord, you said in your word that if you give a prophet even a cup of water, you shall surely not lose your reward. Another verse said you'll share in a prophet's reward. So I thank you, O oh God, and I, I speak double blessing on every individual that did not think it robbery to open their mouth and say happy birthday or who gave something spent time whatever it was lord we thank you we bless you amen and amen all right bless god okay y'all getting tired of the book of james would you say if you were <laughs> amen amen uh, this is the last chapter in the book of James, so we're, we're really progressing quite a way through it. We're going to try our best to get through the first six verses tonight, if at all possible. The title and the, the topic for tonight is a question. Do you have an oppressor's heart? Do you have an oppressor's heart? So let's take a look at the text. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. The outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. In verse 6, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Now, in these first six verses, James again tells the rich in his congregation as well as the rich Jewish oppressors who might be listening. His first two words are, come now. And as he has done before, he is telling them, listen up. He is saying to them, heed my words. He did the same thing, if you'll remember, in chapter 1. 1 in verses 9 through 11 he also did the same thing in that chapter in verse 19 he he wants you to be sure not to miss what he wants to say at this point and in that way James sort of picks up what the prophets of old did Isaiah Jeremiah and, and several of the other prophets where when they wanted to get the people's attention they would say something like, come now. But in essence, they were saying, listen, heed, pay attention, open your ears. The point of it is, is that James is writing something. James is speaking something at this point that is imperative. So imperative, in fact, that James wants his readers to know, if you miss this, 
If you choose not to listen to this, trouble will not only knock on your door, it will barge in upon you. Now, what is it that he's trying to say? Particularly in these first six verses as he starts, and, and if you have the, the New American Standard Bible, you know that that section uh, is, has the, the heading, Misuse of Riches. He, he's really trying to say that if you and I live just to acquire material possessions, we are, are going to end up with nothing of real significant value, nothing of real intrinsic consequence. What will happen is that our lives, because we ran after these things, will be empty. They will be lonely. They will be bitter because that which we are chasing gives us nothing in return. When we chase wealth, all that ends up happening is that we rob ourselves of the greater riches God wants to give to us. And so James tells his readers, don't be fooled by listening to the nonsense that people are wanting to say that wealth is the sign of God's blessing. This is one of the mistakes that's happened in the prosperity movement that if you're a real lover of God, that you will be prosperous and wealthy. But that's not what God says in his word. So James scolds the people in his community, the people of wealth in his community, who had received their wealth from the people who worked for them, who were the equivalent of indentured servants. They were the equivalent of slaves almost. They were sharecroppers. Now, if you know your European history in, 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 in the Middle Ages, this was called, this was called something, uh, this was something called feudalism. Feudalism. And in the Middle Ages, 90% of the people, and, and actually you can go all the way back to even when James was writing and the Romans were in charge of the, the then known world, 90% of the people lived on farms. They were workers, they were serfs, they were sharecroppers. Less than 10% lived in cities. Now contrast that with today, where today better than 80% of the world's population lives in cities, and less than 20% live on farms. These people, they ran the farms. They worked the fields, not for themselves, but for the owners of the farms and the owners of the fields. They did all the work. And after doing all the work, normally what would happen is that they would be cheated by the owners by not getting paid. And the owners rationalized that this was okay. Check this out. Because everybody did it. How often have we heard that as an excuse for people's behavior? Well, everybody else does it. Why shouldn't I do it? Everybody's living together without the benefit of marriage. Everybody's having sex before marriage. Everybody is doing this. Everybody is doing that. You know how much sense that makes. They were craving or I should say not craving, but caving into the worldly pressure of financial success over everything else. James condemns the oppressing of the poor for which a strong reckoning of God was awaiting them. Remember, both the poor and the oppressors were part of the congregation to whom James was writing. Just because you didn't have any money didn't make you a second-class member. It's one of the reasons why here at Kingdom Fellowship, when it comes to giving, we don't talk about equal gifts. Instead, we talk about equal sacrifice. 
do you all know the difference between an, an equal gift and equal sacrifice? An equal gift would be if everyone gave $20 a piece. That's an equal gift. But an equal sacrifice is that for one, let's get real crazy, for one, $500 on a Sunday might be a sacrifice. But for somebody else, a dollar might be a sacrifice. It's not equal gifts. It's equal sacrifice. God does not give you a greater reward because of the size of your offering. In fact, I'll be honest about this. I, I've, I've, I've known preachers over the years who were intimidated by members of their congregation to the point that they wouldn't say certain things in their sermons. Because if I say something that uh, MIT Marone doesn't like, she's, she's going to stop giving. And you know she accounts for a big portion of our giving. That seems crazy, doesn't it? But I know preachers who did that, who do it. Got to be careful not to make, make this family upset. They're some of our biggest givers. So J James condemns the oppressing of the poor. Can we take a deeper dive into it? Let's look at verses 1 through 3 again. Let's, let's look at those. Come now. You rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Verse 2, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. James wants us to know that if it's possessions, material possessions that we treasure, that we chase, that they will be temporary. They will rot. So why would we place our trust in them? You know, if, if you are fortunate enough to be able to purchase your dream vehicle. You spend all that money on that vehicle. Got all the papers signed. The moment you drop it off the lot, drive it off the lot, it loses value. Now, in an age where they really want to sell vehicles, They've begun to change this a little bit, but it used to be that even if you drive your, drove the car around the block and brought it back and said, you know, I decided I didn't want it any longer, you couldn't get your money back. Because material things depreciate. What's the one thing that generally does not depreciate? Land. Land generally does not depreciate. And a lot of families have given away their land and not held on to it. Even if those things we think are important, what we generally find out is that they usually are not. People who place their trust in wealth or in accomplishments or in education or for that matter in themselves. They're headed for trouble. Why? Because it takes them away from God just as surely as chasing the devil does. Both of them lead to the same end. And that end is separation from God. Both while you're here on earth and if Christ is never fully received also for eternity. Even if the person does get saved, they were likely to live a life of waste and no return. And it will be the evidence to convict us of our sin and leave us earthly 
and the danger of being eternally dejected without hope, without meaning. So he starts off with the two words. Come now. It's an exhortation. It's a wail. In modern vernacular, we say, pay attention. Listen up. It includes weeping. In other words, James is so passionate about this that he's weeping. I see you going down the, the wrong road and, 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 and it, it's grieving me to the point that my only response is to weep. Do you remember the times that you've had to have conversations with people pleading with them and you're weeping because you're so emotionally attached and you know you're dealing with issues of life and death. The situation is just that severe. I'm... I'm experiencing something now that I think folks with grown children, or at least I hope they have the opportunity to experience if they've not, and that's having a different kind of conversation with your children than you had when they were kids growing up. Conversations with them about things that you talked about. To hear them say things and say, you taught me this. I remember you saying this. Just this afternoon, I was having a conversation with James. And James was telling me, I can remember where you taught us not to ever try to be like somebody else, but to be who God made us to be. And it gave me the opportunity to say to him, well, you know what? I never told you why that was so important to me. We want them to listen. If it doesn't seem like it matters to us, they're not going to listen. And let me tell you also, sometimes it may seem like they're not listening. But when they see the passion with which you bring it, oh, they hear you. They may pretend they don't hear you, but they hear you. They hear you. So he says in that, First verse, come now you rich, you rich, you rich. He, he's, he's speaking to a particular social class. He's speaking to the aristocracy. Now I want you to understand that he's not condemning wealth. Just like wealth is not condemned in other places in the Bible. I know you've heard people misquote Proverbs that says that, you know, uh, that the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, the more proper translation is the love of money is a root of all evil. Wealth in and of itself is not condemned. Wealth can either be a blessing from God, particularly if we use it as a tool and not as a devotion. When you think about having money, why do you want to have money? Do you want to have money only so you can purchase your dream possession? So that you can go on your dream vacation? Or do you want to have money so that you can be a blessing to the kingdom of God? Help advance the kingdom of God. Here's the interesting thing that wealthy believers who give away their money, when they give away their money, the principle of seed time and harvest kicks in. The more they give away, the more it keeps coming back to them. 
Because the Word of God says that as long as the earth endures, there will be seed time and harvest. Are you here? But Proverbs 10.22 says this, It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. Wasn't that the verse, uh, Lady Sibyl, you were asking me about a, a, few, a few, few days ago? Maybe now weeks ago? It's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. I, I, I cannot have two diamonds to rub together, but, but the blessing of the Lord makes me rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. So the condemnation that James is pointing to is the abuse of money to oppress the poor. Now that's a matter of the heart. That really is. Because our bank accounts demonstrate where we place our loyalty, our commitment, and our interests. It does. You, you, know, you know some of the money management programs that we have that if, if, you, if you itemize where you spend money, you can pull up a pie chart and, and my God, last month, 55% of what I spent went on pizza. <laughs> you, you can track it that way. He says in verse 2, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. You see, clothes were the most expensive possession then. Sometimes even greater than the cost of a home. Clothing they were the primary symbols of being wealthy. The serfs, the, the, the sharecroppers, all they generally had was one homemade garment that was made out of something more like burlap. While the rich had fine cotton and silk. Even in this country, in the African-American community, particularly in the Depression era and coming out of, uh, of slavery into Jim Crow and things of that nature, we, we had churches that were silk stocking churches. If a woman couldn't afford to purchase silk stockings, they couldn't be a member of that church. Some churches, every woman was expected to have a fur. I'm talking about the North, you didn't generally need it in the South. If you couldn't afford to have a, a fur, you couldn't be a member of that church. It said that you were in a lower class economically. Isn't that awful? But that's the history in our community. James was speaking to that situation. So he says, your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten. Verse 3, your gold and your silver had rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and consume your flesh like fire. Now, some texts would say corrupted, but corrupted and rust, they're general terms that refer to anything that can and will corrode and decay by rust, mildew, bugs, weather, wood rot, or for anything destroyed by fire. Now, I grew up in the north where the winters were very severe. And when the roads were snowy and icy, they didn't put slag down on the roads like they do down here in the south. They put salt, salt on the roads. Well, back in those days when I was growing up, the cars were not made out of a whole lot of plastic like they are now. And so the bottoms 
or you know, around the edges of the bottoms of the car and, and around the wheel rims and things. As the cars got older, there would be these rust spots. Depending on how old the car was, sometimes it turned into a hole. We actually called them cancer spots. You grew up in New York, right? Angela, did you grow up up north in Jersey? So you, both of you are familiar with that. Don't tell you, I'm telling the truth. As a matter of fact, some cars, depending on how rusty they were, we said, oh, they're from Cleveland or they're from Buffalo. Because they were up right on the Lake Erie. That's where, where they had the most severe snowstorms. The point is, is that everything corrodes. Everything's corrupted over the course of time. The fine clothing, they will be moth-eaten if you're not careful. I also grew up in that area when you, era when you stored away clothing, what did you put with them? Mothballs. I, I can remember we, we, we went to church camp in the summer and a uh, camp meeting lasted a week. My grandparents had their, their, their own cottage. And at the end of the week, they would pack everything up in the cottage. They'd put it in these barrels and they'd seal the barrels shut. And they'd pack up all the blankets and all the sheets and all the pillows and everything. And then they, every, every layer, they'd put a layer of mothballs and pack another layer, a layer of mothballs pack. Oh my God, because the rest of the year, 51 weeks, well, we go for two weeks, 50 weeks, that house would be closed up and small animals would get in, field mice would get in, moths would get in, and snakes would get in, and the mothballs would keep them out. I can remember as a kid, I used to hate that smell of mothballs. It seemed like nothing I did could get the smell of mothballs off of me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But had you not done the mothballs, your garments would have been moth-eaten. Or the rodents would have gotten into it. People that are devoted to wealth show just how selfish they are. Their motives are selfish. And it's that selfishness that God will judge. So the Christian and the Jewish aristocrats who were oppressing the poor, interesting enough, they all ended up being killed by the Romans. <laughs> so the judgment came for them personally and totally. So here you were up here with the aristocracy, but when the revolt in 66 AD came, all y'all got killed. Your riches didn't save you. It didn't cover you, it didn't protect you. When you seek wealth instead of God, you're robbing yourself of the precious opportunities and the substance of himself and the immeasurable blessings that he desires to give in exchange for a little bit of earthly lust. But don't worry. We have a God who loves us, who provides for us. He fulfills us with himself beyond our expectancy. We have a God who meets our needs. He is Jehovah Jireh. We could trust in him. So we don't need to worry about things. And it's hard not to worry. We all know the verse of scripture, be not anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made unto God. We, we know that verse backwards and forwards. And yet we're flesh and blood. We're prone to anxiety. We're prone to worry. But God loves us. God will care for us. Let's look at verse 4. Verse 4, Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. 
Here's what James wants his readers to know. You may have ignored their cries, but God hears them. Our responsibility to care for the poor must be heeded. There is never an excuse to cheat or take advantage of another person. For when you take advantage of somebody else, you are now in opposition to what Christ has done for us. And what you've done now becomes evidence and testimony against you when you stand in the courts of heaven. Now, I want, I want to say something here because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that on your way home tonight at every intersection you should put money out the window. That only satiates your need to feel like you've done something. But the something that you may have done may have simply been to add to somebody else's addiction. There are other ways to minister to the poor. And there's a difference between being poor and having a poor mentality. How many of you know the difference? See, when, when you're poor, you don't have any money. Most people who are poor don't even know they're poor. How many times have you heard people testify growing up? You know, when I was growing up, you know, we were poor. We didn't have much of anything, but we never knew we were poor. Other people told us we were poor. Why? Because the quality of life. One of the things that I want us to do as a ministry, and I've said this before, is to stop investing only in ourselves. That's one of the reasons why we're investing in international ministry. That's not the only place to do it. God will open up opportunities for do, doing the same thing in different types of ways here at home. But the pressing need for us where God had opened the door was there in Monrovia in Liberia. God will open other doors. And here's the thing for you to understand is as we walk through those doors, God will then bless us with even more so that we can be an even greater blessing. You, you know what my heart's desire is? My heart's desire is at the very minimal for every dollar we spend on ourselves to spend an equal dollar on somebody else. So if we spend $5,000 a month on ourselves, I want to be in a place where we spend $5,000 on ministry outside of us. That's going to take some doing. So this is what James says. He says in verse 4, Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of, Saba, of Sabaoth. The pay, the pay, the wages. To not pay someone was considered to be evil and violated the law of God. People needed their daily wages to purchase food for that day for their families. So if they didn't get paid, they would go hungry after a hard day's work and have to go home to face a disappointed family. He says, you withheld it. What's implied here is fraud because they worked a hard day's labor for you and they were expecting to get paid something by you, but instead you withheld it. Interestingly enough, 
the earnings of the poor were a small fraction of that of the owners. Even what the workers were paid. It was not sufficient to provide care for themselves and their families. You know, we're, we're, we're complaining right now about the, the, the rising rate of inflation. The dollar doesn't go as far now as it did several weeks ago. Definitely as far now as it did a year ago. The average price of, of gasoline in our area, regular, four fifty. Premium, might as well say five dollars. Groceries are more expensive. You're paying more money for less groceries. We're complaining about all that. But at least we still have the ability to put food on our table. They were getting paid, but what they were getting paid was not enough to feed them and their families. And then sometimes they were not even allowed to go back in the field to glean in the field, which was, if, if you go into the old uh, Levitical law, that was one of the laws that you're supposed to leave something in the field for those who are poor that can go and glean. Remember, Ruth was in the field gleaning. Remember, Boaz told the workers, leave a little extra over in this space because someone's coming over here to glean. He was looking out for her and for her mother-in-law, Naomi. They wouldn't even do that. It was fraudulent. Fraudulent. God hates fraud. He says at the latter part of verse 4 that God has heard the cries. They've reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth or the Lord Almighty. Sabaoth is a name of God. It refers to Jehovah Sabaoth. Means literally the Lord of hosts. Check this out. The commander of the angelic hosts and the armies of God. Look what the text says. The outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the commanders of the armies of the Lord. Do you, under, do you get the implication here? How God feels about this? That because of what you have done, the wrath of God is coming upon you. See, the Jews reasoned here that it was a bad idea to offend a public official, much less the God of the universe. So the point here is that our misdeeds greatly offend God, who's all-powerful and all-caring. Now, when James taught this, James preached this, it so angered the high priest that he had James martyred. He had him butchered. He had him killed. So the theme of verse 4 is covetousness. To make one prosperous by the manipulation of another may seem to be a good business model. It may seem to make sense in the ways of the world, but it's evil in God's eyes. Covetousness in the Greek implies taking advantage of a situation for the sake of evil. It can be going too far in bargaining at a market, to having more than what is just in any dealings with others. It was common from rich to poor taking advantage, not, not seeking to get a good deal. And when it's taken too far, it takes advantage of the weaker, less fortunate person. And God says, I hate that. 
doesn't honor him. Well, let's go to the last two verses and we'll be finished for tonight. Verses 5 and 6. James writes, you have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Now, for James, luxury and seeking satisfaction is merely an illusion that brings only temporary relief, doesn't have any real substance to, substance to it at all. It, it might be fun right now, but the fun now and pay later plan is not worth it. Did you all get that? fun now pay later remember our lives as christian has liberty and grace in it but we are never to forget our responsibility and our call if we store up treasure here on earth our hearts will be besieged by disappointments and the storms of life will overwhelm us the real treasure for us is living in Christ. The real treasure for us is sharing Christ with other people. The real treasure for us is what awaits us when we get to heaven. So he says in verse 5, you have lived luxuriously on the earth. What does he mean by luxuriously? He's talking about self-indulgence. You've indulged yourself. How? From, from eating a pound of chocolate at once <laughs> to partying your way to oblivion. You've indulged yourself. You see, too much excess will leave you empty and alone. Too much excess will cause you at best to gain a lot of weight or to lose a lot of your friends. And at worst, too much excess can cause you to lose your life and miss out on your heavenly reward. Self-indulgence seeks what is fleeting. But as Christians, we're made for eternity. Now, I don't know how many of you remember your BC days. And maybe you don't want to talk about it. But just nod your head if you remember days of too much excess. B.C. meaning before Christ. Maybe even since you came to Christ, there have been times of self-indulgence, gluttony, overeating, overspending, all those things. And what James says is that you have lived luxuriously here on earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Oh, you've had a good time, James is saying. You, 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 you have just, some would say, played out. He said, you fattened your hearts. But what, what he means here, the image here is animals being slaughtered. Now, the interesting thing is the animals being slaughtered, he's referring to the rich. In this verse, the rich are the animals who are not aware and don't care. Now, when it comes to self-indulgence and living luxuriously, that describes many people here on earth and sometimes many Christians. We don't even recognize what we're doing. And in many instances, don't care. We want what we want when we want. Sometimes we don't care who we have to hurt to get it or who we have to hurt to keep it. Are we doing this to ourselves? You see, our desires that are contrary to God's calls and precepts 
that's what's going to lead us to destruction. It's not necessarily because God is there waiting with an ax. He's not doing that. God is there waiting for us with arms wide open, loving us. And when we ignore him, when we ignore his call to us, we destroy ourselves. And we're left without an excuse because he warned us that it would happen. A God who doesn't warn is a God who doesn't love. And God loves us, so he warns us. He says, day of slaughter. Day of slaughter. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, what he's talking about here, he's not talking about a, a, a mass murder type of scene or, or mass slaughter. What he's talking about here is a feast of eating meat that occurred after the sheep shearing season or harvest was done. That people would have this fresh supply of meat and they would gorge themselves eating this. Now what James recognizes is that this was a rare cheat, rare treat for the average person, but it's something the rich did every day. They were like the Romans. It's said, if you read Roman history, that the Romans would recline on these pillows, these couches, and they would eat, and they would eat, and they would eat, and they would eat, and they would get up and go purge so they could come back and eat some more. And they did it purposely. It was done to be condescending. They wanted to demonstrate to the people who couldn't do it, ha, you don't have anything compared. Look, I can eat all I want. I can throw this away. I got dogs sitting over here. I got a, a, a pork chop that I just ate one, excuse me, a lamb chop, a lamb leg. Got to get bigger image. A, a leg of lamb. Y'all seen legs of lamb? And I only took one bite out of it. But who cares? I'll throw it over there to the dogs. They didn't care. The only time the poor got to eat meat was at public feast days and festivals. They didn't have it every day. So leading a lavish lifestyle while others who work for you starve or who are the ones you are called to care for. James writes to condemn because Jesus condemns it. You see, the rich in their condescension are just fattening themselves up for the slaughter of judgment. And the judgment, the slaughter, is of themselves, brought about by their own words or their own deeds. So he says in verse 6, he says, You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Now, in this context, condemned is not actual murder. But it is instead the setting up of the events that lead to murder. You see, it's the abuse of power that leads to the loss of life. The rich were taking food away from the people. They were not providing wages. So they starved while they worked. And taking their coats away in extortion, they would freeze to death too. The image is the oppression of the poor as the wicked were scheming against the righteous. And in this context, James warns them, you need to repent. This condemnation of judgment doesn't pertain to a Christian because we're saved by grace. It is a condemnation of the non-Christian because a real Christian, somebody say a real Christian, a real Christian would never do this. That's why at times when you see certain behaviors from people who call themselves Christians, you have to conclude that they're not Christian because a real Christian wouldn't do that.
you'd have to conclude their problem is is they're not saved. Because if they were truly saved, they would not exhibit this type of behavior. See, the audience for what James was writing was the aristocratic Jews and pretenders who said they were Christian. But in their fruit, they showed that they were not. The world says, uh, what? That's what Jesus says. That's true. And the world says that the picture is worth a thousand words. Listen to what I say, but look more at what I do. Correct? James is not saying that wealth is wrong. He's just denouncing wealth when it gets in the way of our relationship to God. And our call from God. When we use it to bring harm to other people. Remember that whenever we draw near to the world, God invariably is pushed back. It is a twofold warning. First of all, we're not to oppress the poor and needy. There is never a reason or a call to do that. Instead, we are to provide help, to educate, to motivate. And second of all, the part, second part of the warning is that by seeking wealth, we are the oppressors ourselves who are seeking what only God is able to fulfill. We sometimes have to remind ourselves when we go past the billboard that shows you how, how large the lottery has grown. How many people are playing the lottery every day just in hope upon hope that they'll win it? When the God that we serve is able to provide us so much more. But Bishop, do you know what I could do with 200 and some billion dollars? Sure. But it's temporary. It doesn't endure. The question is, do we listen up to what God is saying to us? Do we ask ourselves and even God himself, what does God want from me? Because if we don't, our focus in our living is going to be skewed. We're going to focus instead on what the world wants from us. And in doing so, we'll miss out on the things that are much greater worth. For those of us whose pursuit is wealth, it'll become a weed that chokes off the soul from God and from others. One of the hardest things to do is to be a Christian with worldly wealth because it most always leads to worldly interests that leads to worldly activities. I had a friend several years ago, he and his wife, they owned amusement parks around the country. They were very wealthy. They went into to ministry and what their wealth, they gave their money away. They gave their money away. And they kept getting more and more money. And they gave it away. And the husband became an evangelist. But he was an evangelist to the wealthy. And his call was to go to the wealthy and to help them give their money away. Kingdom causes. Wealth can be done, and it can be done for greatness. But most, if not all the time, it only brings darkness to light and buries the Christian soul in the desires of the world. I heard a statistic today that was rather interesting, and it said that over 50% of the elected politicians in D.C. are millionaires. It's very difficult when you're a millionaire to empathize with the poor, to understand what the everyday individual is going through. So you enact laws that only benefit you, but don't filter down to those who are in true need. And it affects the Christian soul. Well, I don't know about you. I mean, if God chooses to bless me with a lot of money, listen, 
Hallelujah. I know what to do with it. I know what to do with it. But that's not my pursuit. I'm not chasing a dollar. There's a whole lot of things I might do differently if I were chasing a dollar. No, let me back up. There's a whole lot of things I would do differently if I were chasing a dollar. God wants us to chase him. I don't remember the author's name, but, but I don't know, Lady Sibyl, if you remember it, but the author that wrote the book, God Chasers, what was his name? Yes, Tenny. That's where we're supposed to be, chasing after God. If you chase after God, I can guarantee you something. You'll have what you need. And not only, not only, not only will you have what you need, but if God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should go back on his word, then God also told us, delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? The things he said you have need of shall be added unto you. The promise of God is to supply every one of our needs. How many of you have everything you need? You may not necessarily have everything you want. Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have clothing on your backs? Do you have food to eat? You may not be eating the food you want to eat. You might not be living where you want to live. You may not be driving what you want to drive. You may not be working where you want to work. You may not be making the money that you need to make. But God said he would supply all of your needs. The good news is, is as you chase him, he's going to allow you to have some of your desires too. Amen. He knows better than to give you every one of your desires because some of your desires are not based upon your relationship with God. Hallelujah. If I actually believed that God would give me every desire that I had, then every time there was a lottery, I would have won it and never bought a ticket. <laughs> the publisher's clearing how sweepstakes would always be in my box. I would want it. Ed McMahon, when he was alive, he'd be visiting my house every time. God doesn't operate that way. But what God has to offer is so much better and so much greater and so much beyond all of that. If we would just seek it. Well, you might be listening to this Bible study tonight and saying, well, you know, I don't fit into that category. I'm not oppressing the poor. But the question that we began with tonight the question of this study, remember it began with a question, and that was, do you have an oppressor's heart? I may not be actually doing it, but where's your heart? And the interesting thing is that out of the abundance of your heart, what happens? Your mouth speaks. Not only does your mouth speak, but your actions follow. Amen. Is this good? Amen. Somebody give God a praise. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Well, bless God. Uh, all this, of course, is made possible by relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. If you stand outside of a relationship with Jesus, I urge you to get right with him tonight. If you need to come back home, come back home. Let the Lord bless you. Amen. For there is no other name under heaven whereby we are to be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Amen? We bless God. I hope you got a blessing out of that tonight and that if you have given your life to Christ or you have recommitted your life to Christ, write me a note 
so that we can rejoice with you as long as, uh, as well as the whole host of heaven and also get with you to try to help you to grow in your relationship with the Lord. I want to invite you too, if you have done that, you need to get yourself into a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. There are a lot of them. We believe we're one of them here at Kingdom Fellowship. We worship at 2925 East Independence Boulevard in the city of Charlotte on the second floor of the Jones Building. We worship at 10 a.m. on Sundays and we study at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights and we invite you to come and worship with us. You can follow us on social media. You're watching us on YouTube or on Facebook. Our YouTube channel, my YouTube channel is Bishop Jim Logan. You can follow us on Instagram at Kingdom Fellows or on Twitter at Kingdom Fellows 7. If you're watching us live on Facebook, we're at kfcc.charlotte. I want an opportunity to invite you to sow into the kingdom of, of, of God and to particularly sow into Kingdom Fellowship. I am so thankful, grateful to God for all of you who have been giving to us over the course of time. I bless God for you. I thank God for your commitment to us. I want to encourage you in your giving. Particularly if you're a member of Kingdom Fellowship, I want to encourage you in your giving. We bring tithes and we bring offerings. I'm so thankful because the, the cry for folks to step up in their giving this past Sunday was heeded and I bless God for you. I want to encourage you to not grow weary in and, and well-doing because we still need you to do that uh, every week. I, I, I'm just tired of what a lot of churches go through, that there's certain times of the year when the offerings decrease. And summertime is one of those times. God doesn't go on a vacation. We ought not to go on vacation, not with our giving. And so I wanna encourage you and thank you in advance for your gifts and for your tithes and for your offerings. Amen? Amen? We want to be able to do everything that God has called us to do. I cannot do it alone, and I cannot do it without you. And I thank God for your partnership in this ministry. So you can give today through Givelify. Those of you who are watching by way of live stream, Givelify is our main online giving tool. You'll find us as Kingdom Fellowship Christian Center, Charlotte, North Carolina or you can give through PayPal. We're there listed the same way. Many of you like to use Cash App. We invite you to give using Cash App. We're dollar sign Kingdom Fellows. Whatever you choose to use in your giving, please accept my offering of thanks to you. Amen, glory to God. I'm looking at the live stream of people that are on and I see uh, if you're still on Faye Adams where you put Phoebe on there. I didn't know if that meant that both of you were watching, but praise God uh, for you. Write me a note in there if that is so or there was another reason that you put her name there. Uh, I would greatly appreciate that before we go off the air. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to pray with you. We're going to pray together. Those who are in the room, if you would stand together, we're going to pray. Those who are watching, if you have a prayer request, if you'll very quickly put that prayer request in the comment field, there's about a 35, 40 second delay here. Uh, so quickly do that. Uh, and as those requests come, if, if I miss it, uh, our live stream is being monitored and it will be brought to me so I can be in prayer for you. And listen, prayer works. Prayer works. Is that right? I am a beneficiary of much prayer. Thank God for people in my life who prayed for me. 
Amen. Because prayer works. I guarantee you there were people praying for you when you weren't praying for yourself. Someone within the sound of my voice might even have the testimony that I am here alive today because somebody prayed for me. Maybe it was a praying grandmother, praying auntie, or praying mother, praying father. Maybe some church mother was praying for you, boxed your ears and then prayed for you. But prayer works. We didn't get to that verse, but we'll probably get to it next week. One of my favorite verses in the book of James is the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. We want to pray for you tonight. Let's stand together as we go to God in prayer. Father, we bless you and we praise you that you are a prayer answering God. Thank you that you are even right now at this moment answering prayers that we don't even remember praying. But in your time, Lord, you're bringing those things to pass. Lord, like the songwriter wrote, we don't feel no ways tired. Some of us have been praying for things a very long time but we're not tired. We've not given up because we know you to be a sovereign God. You move when you want to move, how you want to move, when you want to move, upon whomever you want to move. We bow to your sovereign will for our lives. So we thank you, O oh God, that because you're the author of time, you know exactly when to bless us and with what. But God, we also rest in the assurance that right now we're in a season of overflow. Just lift your hands right now. This is a season of overflow. We bless you, God, that you have blessing upon blessing to pour out into our lives. God, it may not come the way we would hope that it would come, but we thank you that you know best how to bless us. Our hands are lifted now, oh God, let it pour. Let it rain down upon us. Bread of heaven, feed us till we want no more. And then, Lord, as you feed us, as you cause that overflow to flow into our lives, God, you can trust us that we will use it for your glory that we will use it for the building up of your kingdom, for the edification of your church. We bless you for it right now. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. So I do now on behalf of your people that you've placed in my hand, I bind up every trick and every trap of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare that God, the things that you have purposed to do in their lives, that, God, you begin to cause it to come to fruition even right now. Lord, things that they have forgotten about, remind them yet again. Open their eyes that they might see you moving. Open their ears that they might hear you speaking. Increase their gait, O oh God, that they might rush to walk into that which you have called them. And I bless you for it. Forgive us for feeding ourselves and ignoring those whom you put around us in need. Lord, we bless you. We praise you. Now, oh God, hear the prayers of your people. Lord, there's so many people that are watching that stand in need. I don't know what they need, God, but you know. And you promised, according to your word, that as we gave, as we helped out others, that you would supply our need. Lord, supply our need. Supply our need. Supply our need, oh God. That we might be able to be a greater blessing to others. 
And for this, oh God, we give you praise. I pray for that one who's sick in their body. I speak health right now. I command cancerous cells to die. I command tumors to dry up. I command diabetes to disappear. I call down high blood pressure. I call up low blood pressure. I curse every blood disease. I command livers to begin working again. The capacity of the heart to be greater. In the name of Jesus, I come against any type of brain fog, any type of depression, any depressive spirit. In the name of Jesus, I command minds to be clear. I come against cataracts and glaucoma. I command eyes to be open and to be bright, blindness to disappear now in the name of Jesus. I speak the muscles and sinews. Hey God, hey God, hey God. Let that ankle be healed. Let that hip be healed. I speak to that knee in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. We decree it to be so in the mighty name of Jesus. And we give you thanks and praise. Hey God, glory to your name, Jesus. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. I speak to everyone that's within the sound of my voice, whether they be in the room or they be watching by way of live stream. I speak the blessings of God into their lives right now. Lord, I ask you to bless them now from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. May their bread basket be blessed. May their homes be blessed. May their jobs be blessed. May they have not just what they need, but more than enough. I bless you for it right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, let grace and mercy overtake them in the name of Jesus. You be glorified. You be exalted. God, I give you praise. I bless you for it right now. I bless everyone who's watching. Hallelujah. Wherever they be, Lord, in Liberia, bless them. In the UAE, bless them. In Uganda, bless them. Across the street, bless them. Across town, bless them. In the name of Jesus. And we give you praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, somebody bless the name of our God. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. Now rejoice and be glad. The devil is defeated and you are victorious. Everything that he designed for your defeat has been voided. Hallelujah. It shall not work. It shall not come to pass. In the name of Jesus, you're walking in victory. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We pray this in faith in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. God bless you. Yes, yes. I, I can't hear you because of the music. G give her the mic because I can't hear. Oh, okay. We, we invite you to join us Saturday morning at 11 a.m. for intercessory prayer here. Intercessory prayer here at 11 a.m. from 11 till noon. Minister Patricia, Minister Ruth, and uh, Lady Sybil, if you would see me afterwards very quickly, I need to ask you a quick question about our first session to see whether we can do that right after prayer on Saturday. Won't be long.
okay? All right. God be blessed. Did you get blessed today? Amen. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise. Thank you, my God's people, my Father's people, for joining in with us. Amen. I want to invite you to be with us again on Sunday morning. Be with us again on Sunday morning. Amen. I walked out of frame. Be with us again on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you on the live stream. Hey, if you're anywhere in the Metrolina region, come on and join with us. Come and be in the house. It is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. We ought not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let's look for a good time in the Lord. And we bless God for you. Amen. God bless you and good night.